Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on this week in which we study Proper 22, more teachings by Jesus on discipleship in Luke chapter 17, 1 to 10. One of the things I did in the last week, if you were able to see it, is indicate that what we may hear, have here is a sermon series. And um, there's a, it's sort of an interesting thing that's happening here, is this does come at the end, this text, at the end of a section that in the, in the commentary that I did on Luke, marks Jesus' teaching on parables. So we really see this text as sort of the, the ending and the culmination of a, a large discourse. And those of you who preached on 14, 25 to 35, you know that the theme there was disciple, discipleship. So this section on parables has to do with, really, what does it mean to be a disciple? And as many of you know, Luke is the one who has what we used to call in the old days sanctification parables. And, and this is his section of sanctification parables, you know, with the prodigal son, with the, the, the rich man and Lazarus, with the, the unjust steward and the like. At the same time, however, I think there is, and, and, and I suggested this by, by means of a, you know, uh, conferences that I did for pastors, you know, that there is a sermon series here, and that this would be the second in a series of three texts. And, and in a way, this is, if this, is, this is sort of a sandwich here. These are two vivid stories, Rich Man and Lazarus, and of course, Jesus and the Ten Lepers. And in here, we have a series of sayings by Jesus. And the, the, in, in many ways, it is this text that makes and interprets the two texts around it, the one that precedes it and the one that follows it. Now, I, I will very much admit to you, this is an extremely difficult section of Luke. And I think this might be one of the harder text that you're going to preach on. But I, I think there are some really incredibly rich themes here, and you could almost pick, you know, a part of this text to preach on. Because what we find in this text, and this is what I found to be really interesting, and I, I embedded this here in the text that I, I'm using here on the board here, is, is that there are four parts. The first part has to do the, to, to this, this woe, and this is the first woe to the, to the disciples, you know, you can see here that the disciples are, are, the, are the audience. The first woe to them. Um, and, and it has to do with this idea of stumbling block. Now, we're going to have to get a, a handle on that. But, but I think when we, when, we, when we kind of exegete that carefully, we'll see that in many ways, the rest of this text is, in a sense, a midrash, an interpretation of what this scandal is, this stumbling block is. Then the next part of the text has to do with a, a, a great Lutheran theme, one that is also a great Lucan theme, and that is the theme of repentance and forgiveness. And, and this, this is, you know, this is the rhythm of Christian life. This is how Christians live. And <clears throat> I think one of the things we're going to suggest to you is that the scandal is people who withhold forgiveness and, and, or misuse forgiveness or don't, you know, understand that the kingdom is constituted by the forgiveness of sins. I mean, this is one of the, the reasons why I think most of us are Lutherans, because we do understand how central the forgiveness of sins is to, to not just the scriptures, but to the Lutheran faith. Then we see that there's a, a bit of a change of audience. I mean, the, certainly the apostles are part of the, uh, the, the, the disciples, but when he addresses the apostles in Luke, these are the 12. So this is the foundation of Israel. And I think what you have here in this section, and it's made up of two sections, these two verses and then these four verses, you have... Uh, teachings that are directed to the Twelve. And this one, of course, has uh, a, a, a great sort of resonance because it has to do with faith. And they, you know, 
ask Jesus, add to us faith, increase our faith, I think some translations have. And, and Jesus has what I think most of us might say is an outrageous sort of um, illustration of this with the, the faith of a mustard seed. But then you do have this section here at the end that uh, really does resonate with respect to um, the, the pastoral office. And I think what you have really here is in, in Apostle as a humble slave, you, you really do have Jesus addressing some of the issues that face us as pastors and what it means to do the pastoral work and then what it means to suffer uh, in, in that office uh, in which we are called like the apostles did. So anyway, you have, you have four texts here, and they are certainly interrelated. And I mean, the way I like to preach on these things is to try to make sense of all of them, to bring them all together. But that's just a little bit of an, of an overview. And what, one, one last thought here. Um, we just looked at that magnificent parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And if you saw my podcast, you'll see that Moses and the prophets is the main theme. Do they, do they listen to Moses and the prophets? And will they listen even if somebody like Jesus rises from the dead? And I think what we have here in this text, 17, 1 to 10, is how, how, to, how to put this. How do we, uh, this may not be the best way, but how do we use Moses and the prophets in daily life, you know? How, how, how are Moses and the prophets realized in our lives today? How, how do we embody this teaching, okay? And, and I think you have four pericopes in which that is what essentially we're doing. Here are people who are putting into use in their lives the, the, the teachings of Moses and the prophets, and of course, the culmination of those teachings, who is Jesus himself. Now, when we get to this first part, to the disciples, um, as I said, the first woe to them, and it's sandwiched by these two things, two references to, to what it means to, to experience a scandal or a stumbling block. Now, th this is a word that we've seen before in the gospel. Um, we've seen it in uh, 723, where Jesus says, blessed is he who is not scandalized by me. And I think there in, in chapter 7, he's really talking about the one who is not scandalized in me is the one who identifies me as the, the, the one that the Old Testament, you know, kind of pointed to as the Messiah and that they do not take offense at Jesus because he's not a, a Messiah, say to, so to speak, of vengeance, but a Messiah of, of compassion and forgiveness, a Messiah of mercy. And, and there you can see that the language of the theology of the cross is associated with that particular um, understanding of a stumbling block. Now here, I think it's a little different, you know? Um, what, what it's saying here is that it's a, a, a more of a temptation to sin. And, and I think, for my money, the best way to talk about this is that this is the language of apostasy. The stumbling block is something that causes people to apostatize. And the key is, in a sense, understanding who the little ones are, and I, you know, I think, in a, to, just to be simple about it, you can read a wonderful quote by David Mosner in the commentary on this. But, but they are believers. The, the little ones are believers. Um, they are the ones who, you know, have, have followed Jesus. They're, they're the ones who are his disciples. They're the ones who have left everything behind to follow him. They're the ones who see him and repent and, and receive the forgiveness of sins. And woe to those who in some way might cause these little ones to stumble. 
you know, or, or to, to, in a sense, apostatize because they have somehow been um, kept from, and, and I think for my money, th this is a passage that is at the heart of Luke's gospel, and it is addressed to the Pharisees. They have come across people who have the key of knowledge that opens up Moses and the prophets, our theme from last week, and they prevent people from entering the kingdom. Go back and look at that context. And it's a section of woes in chapter 11 to the Pharisees. And here, of course, it's the disciples. And Jesus is saying, don't be like the disciples. Don't deprive people from the key of knowledge that opens up Moses and the prophets. Don't deprive people from understanding who Christ is and what the benefits of Christ are all about. Now this moves, I think, very nicely into the way in which um, we, we see the next section relating to this one. And one, one other thought I, I probably should mention too, you can't talk about the Pharisees or the context you know, of this particular pericope without talking about the proper use of possessions. And the Pharisees are lovers of money, they use possessions to create themselves a hypocritical world to develop their own means of salvation. And in a way, that's how they've misinterpreted Moses and the prophets, that they have created, in a sense, a way of salvation by means of the law and not by the means of Christ. So I think there is something there that is worth our time to consider that too as being involved here. Now look at, look at how Jesus begins this next se section. He uses that word pros ekete, which we you know, oftentimes translate beware, you know, take heed to yourselves, beware of yourselves. And, and, and notice what he says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. Now that's a word that is used of demons, of, of, of sicknesses, and now it's, it's used of a sinner. And why, why do you rebuke someone so that they might repent? Now there you've got the whole office of the keys and what it's all about. And if they do repent, you forgive. And how many times? Seven. Uh, you know, seven times. Isn't that what it says there, I believe? If seven times a day he sins against you, seven times you say in return, you know, uh, you are forgiven, you know. So look, look at the language of repentance and forgiveness and how this is the center of the Christian life. This is the daily rhythm of our lives. And I think, you know, you can see here that there's an echo of the Lord's Prayer, how important that is. One way of thinking about this is that you do not want to be a stumbling block by providing by, by withholding forgiveness um, that should be extended to repentant sinners. And, I mean, here you have really one of the great themes of Luke, of the new creation, that Jesus comes to release people from bondage, of which sin is at the heart of the bondage. So we have, a, we have a very, I think, important section here in which we can recognize very clearly the relationship between these two pericopes. Now, there is a, a bit of a change of focus here because we are addressing a different sort of audience. And as I said earlier, it's not that much different because apostles are disciples, but you know, what a, what a shift here that we have in this particular pericope here. And you can see that the apostles are responding to, you know, the seven times, you know. I mean, it's almost overwhelming for them. That, do they have faith to believe that? And they, that's why they ask, add to our faith here. And that's such an important statement, you know. And the way in which Jesus responds is maybe not that comforting to them. Uh, the faith of a mustard seed. Now, I mean, you all know about the mustard seed and the small and its smallness and all that kind of stuff. But, but really what I think is significant here is what follows. 
and that is that the, 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 the mustard seed uh, says, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Now, one of the things that, that I think Jesus is responding to is that the disciples don't believe that they can do what Jesus is demanding of them in the first four verses because they lack the necessary faith. Um, and they've heard all of these hard words about discipleship from Jesus, and I think at this point they're sort of overwhelmed by the hardness of it all. Do they have faith to do these miraculous things? And here you can see that the, the, there is this, this wonderful paradox that relates to the hiddenness the hiddenness of the kingdom in the smallness of the mustard seed, and yet in that smallness, in that hiddenness, is also the fullness of the kingdom that has power to do miraculous things. And the smallness of their faith in Christ conceals Christ's great power, and that through them, they will provide miraculous things. And those miraculous things, of course, are going to be described in the next section. And they're, they're pastoral things. And, you know, I, th this was one of the things I really struggled with when I, when I wrote the commentary is I, I really found myself wanting to take many of the things that Jesus was saying as a reference to the holy ministry. And I think here's another example of where Really what he's doing is counseling the disciples on the kind of the, 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 the humility that they must have as servants of the kingdom. And you can see here that this is, in a sense, the cruciform shape of the apostolic life. And there are activities here, like plowing. Oh, where is it? Plowing. Um, I can't find it. But anyway, plowing. Uh, shepherding and deaconing, which are so sort of part of what it means. Yeah, here it is. Plowing and shepherding. I couldn't find them. Plowing and shepherding and, and the deaconing, serving at the table. Th these are the things that are metaphors for what it is that we do. You know, here's deaconing, diacone. You know, what are, these are some of the things that we do as pastors. And you can see that this, in many ways, are, are, are images, icons of the office of the pastor. These correspond to the, certainly the, the apostolic activity of the early church. And really what, what you see here is if you, if you look at this and you say this is the context in which forgiveness, and, and notice the Eucharistic dimension of this at the table. This is the context in which forgiveness is in a sense kind of lived out in the community. This is where the community recognizes its, its life in Christ. I think you really begin to see that when you get to the end here, you know, and this very enigmatic statement, which I think we struggle with, at least I did, you know, Verse 10, when, when you do all the things that are commanded of you, you say, we are unworthy slaves. We have we, what we ought to have done, we have done. I, th I think what you see here is that, that Jesus is saying, this may seem insurmountable to you, but I have added to your faith, and, and you will be able to do what I have called you to do, and that and I think this is what the whole theme of, you know, starting back in Luke 12 is all about, that, that when you're faced with confessing the true faith and you are afraid and you're tempted to become like a Pharisee, a hypocrite, you will have faith to suffer for the kingdom, to believe that in these simple things of, of plowing and, and shepherding and deaconing, this is how the kingdom comes about. This is how God is, is doing what God wants to do in you. And in a, in a sense, this is what it means to be a disciple. And now, in this final context, this is what it means to be an apostle. And I think for those of us who are going to be preaching on this text, 
What Jesus is saying here to us is, I have given you the faith that you, that you need to do these extraordinary, miraculous things in the simple things of, of, of nourishing, of shepherding, of deaconing, of, of kind of tilling the ground by means of Moses and the prophets and feeding the people of God with simple bread and wine, which are also my body and blood, that these are the things where you can, at the end of the day, simply say, we have done what you have asked us to do. We are your humble servants. Thanks be to God that you have increased our faith.